know how difficult it is to make a start in farming on your own resources. It's difficult and some people say it's impossible. The next difficulty comes when you've got so far up the ladder and you want to make the next jump ahead, either possibly into an owned holding or into a bigger holding that's more viable and more productive. And this is the stage which our subject today has reached and uh, he's done jolly well so far but he has got, I think, to a crossroads and he's now got to decide just what he's going to do. We're going to hear about that in a minute. Let's first of all look at the farm that he's farming. It's in East Sussex. There can't be many youngsters who leave school one day and start farming on their own account the next. But this is virtually what happened when Trevor George paid his last farewell to the Thomas Peacock Comprehensive at Rye in Sussex. He couldn't wait to get into farming clothes and make a start on his own. Now, some people like to farm pigs, for others only sheep or beef will do. But for Trevor, it was the dairy cow. And at his parents' previous home, well before he left school, he was already rearing Channel Island calves in a shed in the garden. His chance came ten years ago, when farmer Charles Mugridge, for whom he'd been working in the evenings and at weekends, announced his retirement. He offered Trevor the tenancy of Millfield Farm at Peasmarsh. Trevor took over a tiny holding and buildings comprising an oast, a cow shed, barn and a dairy. The original farmhouse already had a tenant and to escape the busy traffic on the road that leads to Camber Sands, his parents sold their weather-boarded cottage. They now live a field away in a bungalow and Trevor lives with them. A ten years on, Years of hard work and some setbacks within the first year, brucellosis reduced the herd to four Channel Island cows. But he persevered. The herd began to expand into black and white cows. Extra land was rented, housing was enlarged from the original six standing cow shed and oast house, and some 30 cows are now loose housed in a pole barn, which cost eight pounds a cow. A bulk milk tank and an abreast type 4-4 milking bale replaced the cow shed and bucket plant. His 30 cows and 20 followers run on 12 and a half hectare. It's the Milldown autumn calving herd that's pedigree freesian or grading up. Now this is the type he likes, of moderate size but deep bodied with a good udder and feet. Her mother was joint interbreed champion at Kent Show in 1978. Breeding his own replacements and building up a good dairy herd, despite his small acreage, provides job satisfaction, and it's his special interest. Two years ago, homebred heifers started to come into the herd. Ten of the homebred cows and heifers in milk are daughters of homeland edema that has hundy blood and is responsible for much of the breeding. Trevor needs at least 25 cows to make this a viable unit. It's a figure agreed between him and his milk board consulting officer, John Hepworth. He makes grass and maize silage in sealed heaps in the field. It's cut and carted, and he buys in about 40 tons of hay. Now John Hepworth listed some impressive results. Average milk yield, 6,600 litres. Stocking, over three cows per hectare. Margin over all feed, 350 pounds a cow. Well, the tight stocking makes this figure right. The aim is to make more high-quality silage and reduce bought-in hay and cake usage. Soil is light to loamy. The maize is continuously grown on two hectare that take all the farmyard manure. South-facing and sheltered, the light land gives him 18 to 20 tonne yields of maize. The cows are strip grazed within 12 one-acre paddocks. It's of medium-term lays, and these get 400 units of nitrogen. 150 units goes on the conservation and the young stock area. 
He's currently feeding 48 hundredweights of cake that is brought in by a 14-ton bulk blower vehicle from the mill at Robertsbridge. The nuts are blown into the old oast house, a seven-ton load. Now, buying in bulk, the norm these days, saves Trevor about six pounds a ton. But it will have to be bagged and distributed manually for feeding. In fact, Trevor spends quite a lot of time and effort humping and heaving and shoveling. It's a penalty imposed by lack of capital and lack of facilities. Probably the most important item of equipment on this holding is Trevor George's spinal column. It's good to know that the cost of the equipment he's purchased, including a £1,000 milking bale, and the money borrowed to start up and expand should all be paid back this year. He certainly hasn't wasted his money. Most of the equipment is second-hand. And it served him well, responding to the same sort of care and attention he gives his cows. It includes two tractors of 1956 and 1958 vintage that cost him a total 500 pounds and they're still going strong. They do all the work on the farm apart from ploughing, which is contracted. A baler, which cost 100 pounds, has done 9,000 bales of wheat straw, which is bought in the field. The cows are fed twice in the bale, milking is at 6 a.m. and 5 p.m., hay is always on offer, and the cows also get a midday feed. Now, this feed will include two kilos of sugar beet nuts and two kilos of cake. The herd also gets two feeds of silage, which is fed ad lib. Through close attention to detail, a love of stock and self-taught expertise, Trevor George has achieved some impressive results. He's 25 years old now and at the crossroads. Despite backup support from his father, who's a builder, and moral support from his mother, he's virtually on his own, with little or no regular time off. How to climb the next step of the ladder? Being a dedicated cowkeeper is a help, but it's not enough. He needs, perhaps, just a little bit of luck. Well, we've got Trevor George with us in the studio today. We've also got with us his Milk Marketing Board Consulting Officer, John Hepworth, and we'll be talking to both of them, of course, starting with you, Trevor. Since I left you, it seems to have done nothing but rain in your area, so it must have made life even more difficult for yes, you. Yes, yes, it's uh, always worse when it's raining. Now, you work, as far as I can tell, 365 days a year, non-stop. Yes, yes. You don't get a day off? No, no, no. Have you ever had a day off? No, only the odd milkings, that's all. I believe you did get to Kent's show last, last summer and, yes, and your dad right. came in on the morning milking. Yes. Uh, you've done that for ten years? Yes, yes. When right. you left school, Trevor, you were 15, 16? 15 and a half, actually. Uh-huh. What was it like the first month or so? <laughs> strange. <laughs> very tell strange. It, t do tell us about it. Yeah, very strange. Yeah. It's difficult to adjust at any time, I suppose, but uh, being young, I suppose, going into farming on your own like that, it's very... But were you, were you completely on your own at that age, with, with what, uh, several cars, I don't know how many cars you had there, not many of course. No, I started with uh, six. Uh-huh. So. And, and you did it all yourself? Yes, virtually, you know, father helps with the jobs that need two pairs of hands, so. Mm. Well, at 15, that was something. Yes. <laughs> and you had been helping, with Mr Mugridge, who'd had the farm before you. Oh yes, I've been there at the weekends and in the evenings, mm. which uh, I managed to work into it like that. Sure. Well, you see, the impressive thing about your performance of the figures that we've collected and which you'll be discussing later on, uh, your herd yield, your stocking rate, which is very high, and on top of the high stocking rate, uh, you're getting, what did I say, 20 tonnes an acre out of your maize for 50, about 50 tonnes a hectare, I suppose, yes. uh, which is very good. Yes, it's the ideal situation for growing maize. Yeah. And... Uh, any, have you looked around, is there any chance at all on where you are of expanding it in any direction? Can you rent land or can you get, you know, accommodation land? Only small parcels of grazing agreement land, which uh, tends to be what other people don't want. <laughs> <laughs> They'll only let you graze it, so you, yes, you, you'd want a, to cut it, of course. Yes, ideally, but it's usually grazing only. Yes, yes. Well, let's take up the story with John Hepworth. How long have you known Trevor on his holding, John? I've been going there for about four years now. Mm -hmm. And what was your impression at the start? What sort of policy have you suggested he ought to follow? Well, the, the main policy was to try and make a living out of dairying. Um, 
resulting from that is, is everything that he is doing. Yes. Um, namely that he needed 25 cars, we felt, at that time. That was four years ago. That was four years ago. Mm. And at the moment there are 30 cars in the herd, because with yeah. current financial pressures we felt more cars were needed to get a reasonable living. Do you regard 30 cars, in Trevor's case, as viable? Yes, I would think so. I think if you're selling the milk wholesale, then it's going to be around, around that number of cows that one will need yeah. to get a reasonable income from it. With absolutely no labour at all, of course, not even reliefs. No, no, I um, certainly agree with the comments you made about the hard work involved. Yeah. I think it's interesting to note the sort of performances achieved yeah. um, with very simple equipment. Yeah. I think there's a, a lesson there for farmers with some very smart equipment who aren't achieving anything like the same sort of figures. Yeah, it's dedication really, isn't it? When, when you think that in ten years, uh, as far as I can tell, he's never, be, he's never had one day off from that holding, uh, mm. apart from occasional morning relief from his father who's, who's, who's done the milking for him, and I don't, I don't think that's happened all that often, because uh, his father told me incidentally that when he does do the milking, <laughs> Trevor gives him a bit of stick if he doesn't do it right, so, yeah. <laughs> you know. But uh, the other thing that worried me um, was the question of illness or injury uh, working in that holding, which requires a lot of manual effort. I yes. think you, you've worked out more or less, I'm sure, what sort of manual effort is required. That's right, yes, we did work out some figures and we reckon that Trevor is moving or lifting about two tonnes every day. Yeah. whether it's the cake for the cows or the straw or moving muck. Yeah. And that is obviously a lot of effort involved. Yes. So if he had the money, what equipment would he? Would you suggest he ought to get to help out, you know, to, to, to stop this humping and heaving to some extent? Well, I think if, if there was money available, I think it's um, very interesting as to where it should go. There is obviously the temptation to put the money into convenience factors to make life easier. Yeah. But obviously that isn't, isn't going to improve the profit. Yeah. The profit will be improved if we can see ways of doing yet better on the existing acreage, yeah. or if there's some land coming up and putting the money into that. Yeah, so let's take up from there then, Trevor. What would you think, if you had the money, assuming you had a hypothetical case, where would you spend it? Mm, additional land and livestock, I should you, imagine. You wouldn't spend it on making life a bit easier for yourself. No, that wouldn't produce any extra return, would it? So that would be hard to justify. It might, it might, though, avoid the danger of either illness or accident. And yes. having seen you lifting up trailers by your own muscle power and uh, moving um, muck spreaders onto the PTO of a tractor, yes. uh, more or less by your own muscle power, I must say I, I was rather concerned. Yes. Wouldn't be difficult, would it, to slip or break your back or twist yourself or break a leg? You see what I mean? No, no, I suppose that's a valid point, yes. But uh, you've kept going despite all those problems. Yes. Trevor, we shall come back in a moment, and in the second half we're going to be joined by John Nix, who will go into the economics of this situation. See you in a moment. Part two of our program making a start, and we've been joined now in the studio by John Nix, a regular advisor, of course, of White College. John, I don't know whether you've come across anything quite as basic as we've seen with Trevor George. I must say I haven't. Well, I think, in fact, there are quite a few herds loads around the country. We have to remember that the average size of herd is, in England isn't much more than 40. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, you, you always come across the people with 100, 200, 300, 500 mm. cow herds because they're the ones who get the publicity. But a lot of smaller producers, but I'm not sure there are too many who've achieved what Trevor has done in 10 years from a couple of Jersey cows to uh, 30 Frisians. I mean, yeah. this is a tremendous achievement, of course. Well, I, I tend, of course, to get into the 100 cow herd minimum size in, in, in this business. And uh, you, as you say, you do tend to forget that there are a lot of smaller people who don't often get publicised. That's right. In fact, uh, John Hepworth tells me he's actually got one client who's got 12 cows, and he's only recently gone part-time farming. Yes. At any rate, what do you think, then, of the uh, performance that you've heard so far of, jo of Trevor George's herd? Well, the, you know, it's a tremendous achievement, really, when you think it, you know, the effort that has to go into this sort of development, and all starting, what, straight from school with yes, guess, limited experience. Uh, to build up to 30 cows from his own resources, I guess. I, th I mm, think Trevor virtually. has what, uh, built these up himself. He hasn't bought in cows, has he? He sort of reared these, reared these up. 
Yes, and, uh, generally I, speaking, he has. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm amazed, really. Uh, we'll be hearing about the, his uh, results uh, shortly, and you, mm. we'll find that they're very good indeed. Well, I can tell you that in from 23 cars in the previous season, uh, the total return was some £19,700, and uh, this season, uh, ending in March, it's going to be something like 24000 Yes, the mar cars. I think the margin uh, over feed is probably of the order of sort of £10,000. Then all the other expenses have got to come off that. One can yeah. make a living on that, but of course, in order to achieve it, one is working as Trevor, yeah. as we saw, Trevor is working 365 days a year non stop. It, it, it's and a has been for 10 years. Yes. <laughs> and you've and known him for four of those 10, I think, uh, John Hepworth. Yes. And what service is the Milk Board giving? Well, we're firstly having a look at the financial side and keeping a monthly report yes. to see what the costs are of producing the milk and indeed the value of the milk coming back. Uh, the second item is looking forward over a two-month period in a fair deal of detail yes. to see what the milk output's likely to be uh -huh. and per Full cow and for the herd yeah. as a whole. And having done that, we then usually discuss what's happening on that day and any other items that may come up, such as how does one feed pears to cows, uh, and this sort of thing. I'd forgotten about the pairs, there's a point I want to make, but first of all, let's see what sort of figures your work's been producing, and perhaps you would talk about them for us, John. Yes, yeah, so on the monthly report, these are the sort of figures that come through. A margin per hectare over all purchase feed at £1,205, and I feel this is the most important figure on that table. Uh, that is nearly twice the, the average for margin per hectare. Uh, other figures are the average yield per cow and heifer at six, just under 6,500 litres per year. Concentrates fed per cow at 2,386 kilograms. That is high, but there again one has to take into account the stocking rate of 3.3 acres, sorry, 3.3 cows per hectare. Um, and the final figure there of a calving index of 367 shows that one can both have a very high yield and a very good carving interval. Surely, surely. Well, let's take that from you, John. Nix, good Yes, figures. these are tremendous results, really. Obviously, that output, as John was saying, is extremely high. Yeah. Um, you, you've, of course, got to achieve that if you're going to make a living off of uh, 12 and a half hectares or 30 acres. It's the sort of thing you have to strive for. But again, not too many people achieve it. The yield, extremely high. Um, 1450 gallons, if we can go back to the old imperial uh, levels, if you allow that, Mark. A very, very high stocking rate, indeed, even allowing for the fact that uh, Trevor purchases hay. Um, the mar a lot of concentrates, but as uh, John has said, you, you have to with a very high stocking rate and that right. sort of yield, you're not going to get it otherwise. And uh, he's got a margin over concentrates of, I think, probably exceeding 400 pounds a cow, which is, which is the thing that matters really to get a bit stocking rate. And that's, again, well above average. So yes. it's a. Uh, it's, it's quite a remarkable a level. And from there, Trevor George, you've got to move on. And quite how you're going to do it, I don't know. It's yeah. difficult, isn't it? That's the problem that faces most people in my position, isn't it? Have you applied anywhere for uh, another holding? I'm applying for a county council or small holding now, actually. Mm -hmm. and what sort of acreage would that be? 60 acres. With mm. good buildings. It's, uh, it would be the ideal next step, but... Uh, what will come of it? Yeah, uh, let me just talk about the pears quickly because uh, I did want to make the point. You're using intervention pears, yes. feeding your cows. Very good pears they are too. I mean, you let me eat one while yes. I was there. Yes. The comet pears. Yeah. It does seem a nonsense, doesn't it? Uh, yes. That these pears are being fed to yes. cows. However, let's not enlarge on that and get into another remote realms of the EEC. But I, it seems to me, Trevor, that your main problem, I think, is to get a wife. Am I right? Probably, yes. Yes. Because it would be a great asset. I suspect, you see, that uh, the county council uh, committees who interview candidates probably prefer married men to bachelors. Yes, I think that's fair comment, yes. And you haven't got much chance of uh, socialising, have you, Except apart from the apart from no, the girl? No, that's the trouble if you're always working. It, uh... So, what, what do you think? You, you can't go on forever, can you, on, on, on the standard you're, you're meeting at the moment, however well you're doing? No, no, that is the basic problem now, isn't it? Where to go? Mm. Would your parents would your parents be prepared to uh, come in with you? Mm, but uh, even so, buying a property... Well, great. you haven't got to buy a property. If you had your parents with you, you might stand a better chance on a county council oh, small building, I was thinking. Yes, yes. Yes, I suppose that's a good point, yes. You see, you've got the capital, you've got the capital uh, in your cows, and you've got your parents. Here's your father, who incidentally is a builder, 
does give you some help from time to time. And when we were there, he was repairing the old oast house. Mm -hmm. And he is an ex cowman himself, isn't he? Yes, that's right. So he can help out with the odd milking. But you see, we come back to where you jump from now. And you, as I see it, you, you've really got to try and make a move somehow. Um, and again, I would have thought your parents were the best bet. Yes. I'm not, you know, trying to put words into your mouth. The, tr the trouble is, Mark, I mean, it is so difficult, isn't it? You've got land fetching nearly £2,000 an acre. You can't find farms to rent. If they do come up, because, you know, for all sorts of reasons, succession of tenancies legislation and all the rest of it, if they do come up and then somebody offers some ridiculous rent in order to get it, mm. then probably uh, Trevor couldn't match in his position. And so it does make it tremendously difficult. And so county council small holding is one of the few possibilities, unless you can find a bit more land to rent, and you, you discussed that before before and it's difficult. You must be very, I mean, do you never consider Trevor now and then, my gosh, if I gave it all up and, and, and took a job, I could, I could earn probably more as a cowman on a, on a hundred cow herd or something, or, or, or even a bigger one, a head cowman, and uh, I, then I could have a five or five and a half day or six day week anyway, at least you'd have some time off. And no humping. Yes, that's, job satisfaction rates very highly in my priorities, so. Uh... Yeah. I, I don't know. consider you that wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't consider that. No, yeah. not I'm, really not, not. I'm not suggesting you should. It's just that I, I would have thought you'd be tempted now and then when you were struggling away, as you were having to do, obviously, on this sort of, well, the way you are. Have you had any, given him any advice on this, John Hepburn? Yes, I think that there are some options open to Trevor. I mean, firstly, there, is, there are areas on the existing acreage where the farm can be improved. Um, we're certainly looking for improvement on the milk quality. Yes. And if that improves by two or three classes, then one could be looking for another £14 pounds per cow. So he might have another year or two trying to boost his income and produce productivity and then have another go at looking around for a farm. And I wish, I do wish we had more time, but we haven't. I've got to say goodbye to you now. We shall be back next week looking at the problems of the apple industry. <laughs>